you guys have all probably flown in an airplane, right? Have you guys ever flown an airplane? Yes. Yourself, fly an airplane? You've done it? It's a trip. Yeah. Didn't land or anything like that, but once my uncle got me up there. Once you got up there, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what happened to me. I had an opportunity to fly. I had a friend of mine. His name was Dan Kern. Uh, he, uh, he had a Grumman four-place cheetah. And uh, I remember uh, we took off from Kendallville and went flying one day, and he was a clown. <coughs> I was so angry with him. I would have killed him, except I knew that we'd have both died because he was always playing games. When we first took off, he, uh, he was real quiet, told me to shut up. And he went around the aircraft and he was concentrating on what he was doing, made sure everything was good. You know? Then once we hit that point, we got in the, into the air, he was just clowning around. And uh, he had me put my hands on the stick, which is like a wheel, you know. And he goes, just don't move. And he let go. And he goes, you're flying. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's nice. Grab onto this because there's two, two places, right? And as we were flying, he says, I think I'm going to lay down and take a nap now. So, you know, and I'm like, cut it out, you know, <laughs> cut it out. And he kept going on and going on. We were flying around Wolf Lake. Uh, one of the things that he did is he took the aircraft and, and tipped it sideways, right? And as you know, when you're sideways, you have no more lift. So what happens? You go down quick. So by this time, he was laughing and giggling at this being a clown. I was getting really upset. So I reached over like this, and I had him by the back of the neck. You know, and he goes, you're not going to do anything to me because we'll love that. You know, and I was like, I was so angry. And, but it was a riot. I remember looking out the window, and I seen a road and a field, and I saw that telephone pole coming up pretty quick. You know, and then he rolled out of it real quick. You know, but anyway, I mean, my stomach was just, like, all over the place, you know. Did a couple of screwy things. We did a stall. I was going to kill him. You ever had a spin in a stall? Isn't that fun? Feels like when you, <laughs> when you realize that gravity takes over, Okay, and you're not going up anymore. <laughs> and then it's like, straight down, you know, until you get that lift going. Uh, why did I bring that up? Because Ephesians is sort of like that in a spiritual sense, because it's showing us a vision of what we are in Christ, seated in heavenly places. It's like, um, you know, if you've ever gone to the museum, the, the science museum in um, Smithsonian in Washington, they have a theater there that the screen is five stories high. And you begin to, they do this thing. It, it's really weird how the seats are because you're like really higher. Yeah, it's like a really sloped angle. And so you have nothing obstructing your vision up this way and down. And they show you what man experienced for the first time like in a balloon. And you hear the sounds and you feel it in your seat. And if you've never flown, it's like, you know, people are like, oh. You know, because you see the first time the vertical movement and you're looking down, which man was never able to do, you know, until the balloon flight came along, right? And it's sort of that way in Ephesians in the spiritual sense because we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. When we're living in the, the world, the realm of the world, we're sort of earthbound, right? Okay? But we know that we have escaped the bounds of this life because we have accepted Jesus Christ. Um, a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about the renewed mind, remember I said, it was Romans 12, 1 and 2, um, I'm trying to remember here, it says, you know, be not therefore conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay. To be conformed means that you're like in a form. You can't get out of that form because this is the form you're in. Okay? When we conform to the world, we are miserable. When we look inside of ourselves, we're miserable. When we look out into our fellow man in the realm of the natural realm, we are miserable. When we transform ourselves by the renewing of our mind, Okay, we change and we begin to become more Christ-like because this is what He made available to us. He made it available for us to be able to be seated in heavenly places. Okay, that is our destiny. 
So instead of being conformed to the world, we have to be transformed. And we do this transformation. There's a Greek word called metamorphuo, where we get the word metamorphosis. Really cool. Because have you ever seen a caterpillar? Kind of ugly. But then all of a sudden, that caterpillar changes into a butterfly. Beautiful transformation. That's that metamorphuo. Metamorphosis is our word. And that caterpillar, which is earthbound, and is conformed and constricted to the earth, all of a sudden goes through this incredible transformation and becomes a butterfly. And what happens? Escapes the boundaries of the earth and can look out and around and see, boy, but this is what I come from? And that's a beautiful word in the Bible because it describes, uh, you know, sort of what we're going through in our lifetime. Right now, we're bound in this physical body. Paul said it was vile, death room. It's death room. It's going to die. It's not going to go on. But the eternal life spirit that we have in us through Christ Jesus, okay, we have all eternity seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding greatness of his kindness to us. See, it's, it's amazing because it's this incredible transformation. So part of that renewed mind that we have the ability to operate, to do, to apply, is contained in Ephesians 4. I'm going to show you um, verse 20. And there's, there's former things that come before verse 20. But in verse 20 it says, But you have not so learned Christ. So I'm going to concentrate on the after thing. Verse 21. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So we see something here where we're going to put something off. Okay? We're going to put off that old man. That old man died when you were born again, God's Spirit. So Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's absolute tense. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Okay, I'm going to try to describe this and see, because this is my understanding. My understanding is limited, but I'm trying to study it out. It's, I'm, it's a lifetime, lifetime of university learning, I guess, in the Word of God. We never learn it all. But let me think of how this works. In Peter, that verse that, uh, where he was writing, and he said, being born again, not of incorruptible seed, or not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And I was thinking about the emphasis in the word is on the incorruptibility of the seed. If it's an incorruptible seed, what kind of a seed is it? It's incorruptible. It cannot corrupt. So if God in Romans told us that he just, we were like all of us, no flesh should be glorified in his presence. Okay? He knew that none of us would be able to by our own merit to be able to get with him. Amen. That's what he wanted, that fellowship. We just can't do it in our flesh. We can't do it. So what he did is he moved through Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. And he was the righteous branch. We don't want to think that way sometimes. Look what I have done. You see? But he was the righteous branch. And so he became the propitiation for the sins of all mankind. The propitiation means full payment. So that we receive by grace. We didn't earn it. We receive by grace. This is why eternal life is a gift. We already got it. The reason why you got it is because you believe in Him. You wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't believe in Him. I just know. You don't have to do a salvation meeting because I know every single one of you, you can't stand in the presence of the Word when the Word's being talked about and stand there forever because if it's just not in your heart, you're not going to come back. Right? You've already accepted Jesus Christ as your living Lord and Savior, believing God raised Him from the dead. Or he rose from the dead. Okay? So the accomplishment is already there. Now, this is what happens. You hear about this uh, particular word in the word, and it's a peculiar word. It's called remission of sins. But you see it a lot in Acts, but it sort of drifts out, and you might see it a couple times in Ephesians. But there's a difference between remission of sin and forgiveness of sins. See, remission is for the unsaved sinner. Because when we're born in the world, we're born a body and soul. Anthony talked about soul. 
really opened my understanding to a lot of things because I, my thinking of soul life was a breathing human being. You're breathing, you got soul. You don't breathe anymore, you don't got soul. <laughs> you know, the Hebrews called it nefeshkah, a living, breathing thing. Okay? How did I get on that? So we were all like body and soul when we were first born into the world. We're just born body and soul. We have no spirit. This corroborates with 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. A lot of times when you talk about the Word to people, they're like, eh? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And if you get an unbelieving one, it's more like, okay, shut up. Right? Because they don't want to hear it. It's foolishness. It just doesn't line up with the logic of the world. That's the natural man. Well, when we're in the world, we're in a natural state until we begin to see that we have a different clothing. We have, um, in Romans, it's like a progression. Uh, how many sonship rights do we have in Romans? I counted five. We have justification, sanctification, ministry of reconciliation, righteousness, and redemption. We've already got it. It's not something you go pray for. You've already got it in Christ Jesus, okay? Justified. If he, if he is the just and the justifier, Jesus Christ, the righteous branch. Okay? You've already got it. But sometimes you don't feel like it. That comes back to the renewed mind. Oh, I don't feel like it. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's reality. Okay? But I don't feel like it, oh Lord. I don't feel like I'm a son of God. But what part of the category is that in? Up here. The battle's in the mind. See? He already won the battle for us. So the purpose of the adversary, Satan, is to take that away from you. He will, you know, and he's right there in your ear. You're worthless. <laughs> I go through that about it every day, just about every day, you know. You know, last week I was going to call Anthony on the phone here. It was about maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. I was feeling kind of low, you know. And I was like, I'm not going to teach Sunday. Because I, I, I I, I, I'm not worthy. And I was talking to my wife about it. She says, nobody's worthy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the first, one of the first things that came out of my mouth is, um, God, I have no standing with you. You know what I mean? I'm in this flesh thing. It's terrible, right? I'm locked in. <laughs> you ever feel like that? Okay? It's like walking out on a plank and you feel like, you know, the next step, you're going down, right? And you, you know, parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about, man. You have that feeling, right? And then you've got the old bird, he's right there. Oh, yeah. You're worthless. And you've got over here, you've got the Word of God saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I have sonship rights. Mister. See, and you, and you begin to quote the Word and you begin to see God moving again because you are allowing the Word of God to sink in there. That's the renewed mind. How did I get off on all that? Okay, put off the old man with his deeds. Well, who's got to put it off? I do. You see that? You can't do it for me. I can't do it for you. you got to do it. Put off the old man with his deeds. We know all about those deeds, don't we? Where was I at? Yeah, okay, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you and that ye put on the new man. Okay, don't you ever, I, I got a pair of tennis shoes. My wife got these for me a couple weeks ago. And I have done everything I can to keep them in good shape because this is the only thing that I have to come to church in. Some of my other shoes... <laughs> And I like to keep mine for like 10 years, and it's just not pretty. <laughs> Anthony knows what I'm talking about, right? You got your, uh, your mowing shoes, right? They're greener than the grass you're cutting. Let's put it like that, right? <laughs> okay? They're a haven for ticks, you know? <laughs> and the first thing you get is do not wear those in the house or you will die. Right? You know what I'm saying? Okay. The soles are no longer on there. They're flopping in the breeze and so on and so forth. Duct tape is a biggie, you know, when it comes to preservation of shoes. How did I get on that subject? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, we're out in the garden, right? And you're not thinking. You know, we got to go out and we're hoeing in the garden and, and mounding stuff up, you know, and getting ready to water. And I realized, you know, because I was kind of tiptoeing around. And I realized, oh, I got my new shoes on. 
can't be weird. Right? So we had to run in and take those off. And I've already damaged them. I mean, you know, it doesn't take much, right? But I think of this when I'm, when I'm thinking of this, these verses. Put off. Put on. It's like changing clothes. Does that make any sense? All right. Um, you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And I was thinking about that because I heard a guy say one time, um, you know, somebody that's stealing or lying. They say, well, we'll get together and pray about it. Well, there's nothing to pray about. It just says, Qu quit it. That's all. If you're lying, quit lying. If you're stealing, quit stealing. There's no prayer about it. Just do it. Right? Okay. Why am I thinking about this? Because, see, we, we know the word is in our heart. We just have to apply it. We just have to apply it. The more we apply, then the more we receive the benefits of it. So a lot of times, the, the hit and miss thing is from a lack of the knowledge of the word. See, you understand? A lack of the knowledge of the word. If I know this in the word, I can't do the thing which is wrong. So I was forever telling my sons and my daughter, do the thing which is right in the sight of the Lord. Then he's going to bless you. If you do the thing which is right, this, not in front of your neighbor, do the thing which is right in the sight of the Lord. That's easier said than done, I know. But it's just an example. He's with you. When you leave out of here, you've got an hour with the believers, and we're all on our best behavior. Most of the time, we've got our good tennies on, like me, <laughs> right? Until I walk on out of here and get in the world for a while. Okay, that seed is a really interesting thing. Let me tell you why. When you're born into a household, you have an earthly father. Okay? When you please your earthly father, you had something called fellowship. And I don't know about you guys. I mean, I had a good relationship with my dad over the years. But I mean, we, we went back and forth. But I remember when I was 16, I realized I got to get on my dad's good side. Because he's got wheels, and I do not. And I want those wheels. Okay? So I started doing stuff. You know, mowing the lawn, you know, doing stuff without having to be told. Not giving them an argument. You know, and I was, I was working them over, man. I was, I was, you know what I mean? But I was really trying to get in a good standing, so to speak, right? So when the time came, you know, and I'm out there washing and waxing a car, you know, and he's like, okay, ding, 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 date. Bingo. Okay? So he knew that all this stuff that I was doing was trying to get him buttered up to the point because I had a good standing with him. Okay? You know what I'm saying to you? Totally not. Okay? How did I get on all that? Okay, so there's a difference between standing and state. There's a difference between uh, standing and state, sonship and fellowship. Here's your sonship. I'm always the son of my father. <coughs> Genetically, I mean, he can get really mad at me. We've had some, haven't you had that type of relationship with your dad? He gets really <coughs> ticked off, and then you're like cut off. <laughs> right? Like, really cut off, you know? <laughs> it's not pretty. Yeah. Okay. And you know, you got to come back a long way to make that, that relationship right again. Well, it's sort of like that with God in a way, but he did, it's just that he's more pleased with some than he is with others. But what he did was he sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise because he knew he just concluded all in unbelief, is what he did. Because he knew that none of us, none of us would be able to make it. But yet, the way we judge each other is as though our works are what make us clean and good. But you understand, from God's perspective, go, go up a couple of flights of the plane and look down and understand that in God's standpoint of view, He just concluded us all in unbelief. You're all idiots. <laughs> every one of you. Every single one of you. So what He did was, through Jesus Christ, who was perfect, okay, we all entered in on His behalf. And he became the propitiation for the sin. See, he became the mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. He is the mediator, the defense attorney. When we stand in that presence, he is our shield. You see? He is that shield. He's the defense. Because he laid down his life for us. This is why he tells us to love one another. Don't judge one another. Love one another. You see? You see how it works? Now, what was I thinking about C? Oh, this is really cool. I'm still the son of my father. Even when I was in the, in the worst times, 
I could still call him Dad. Okay? Dad. Well, think of it. Father. What kind of, what a wonderful thing that is. He calls us, okay, he calls himself toward us Father, which means he has a relationship with us. He wants us to do the right thing. But when we do not, he sets it up so that we have forgiveness of sin. When we, when we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. I'm going to scramble up the words a little bit to make you understand. Broken fellowship. See, when I got born again of God's Spirit and confessed Romans 10, 9 and 10, I got that seed which is incorruptible in me. Still a son of God. You're still a son of God. Even though when you don't think you're a son of God, you are a son or daughter of God by birth through Jesus Christ. It is an inherited reward. No one can take that away from you. It is eternal life which is a gift of God. Okay? Now here's what happens. As you live your life, sometimes you stumble. You fall. It's a walk. Remember we talked about the walk? Sometimes you stumble. So what do we have? We don't have remission anymore because we've already had remission when we got born again. That's remission of sins. Okay? It's a once and one only time occurrence which makes you a son or a daughter. You are now a daughter. You are now a son. You don't have to go back and become a son or a daughter. So this is how we play it in the world. We go to get up to a church on Sunday morning and get up Next thing you know, it's Monday, we're at work. Next thing you know, Wednesday rolls around, we forget everything about it, and by Friday night, we're going out with the boys at the bar. See what I'm saying? Okay, I'm just using it as an illustration. We make a mistake, we do something wrong, we correct ourselves, we come back to the knowledge of the word that we have, and we say, Father, I'm sorry. He is faithful and just to forgive you because you are his son. That's how he did it. So he, what he did is he cemented you. That's the ceiling. You always have that ceiling of Holy Spirit. It's not something He does and then takes away. This is the way I had learned as I was growing up. It's like a seed. On Sunday morning, you're doing good. You're all dressed up. You're going to church. You're doing the right thing. And the seed's in there. Then you go along through the week. The next thing you know, you do something wrong. Boop! It takes the seed out. You're no longer a son. No. You see what I mean? That? You go, boop, boop, boop. Well, that doesn't happen in our earthly family, does it? No, because you're still the son of your father. You see what I mean? We have that relationship. That's why we have forgiveness of sins. Because you're already a son of God. So if you look at the sonship rights, justified, is justified never sin. That is remarkable. That is remarkable. Oh my gosh. It's hard to believe it. That he'd already moved through Christ and already gave us all this stuff and we know nothing virtually about it. Justified never sin. Well that's what happens when you Study these in Romans and you come to the point of Ephesians because it's addressing you as though you are, it is an established, it is an established realm. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. So the full payment is completed. The redemption of which we were purchased back. And he came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what he did. He did it completely. It's remarkable. Righteousness. The God-given ability to stand in the presence of God without any sense of sin, guilt, or condemnation? Is this why Romans says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Well, see, I already, when you got born again, you got Christ in you. This is how we come up with the word Christian. Did you know that? They were first called Christians in Antioch of Syria. Paul was running around them in their dim days, and what they were doing is they kept talking about they had Christ in them. That's how they come up with that surname, Christian. These are the Christian people. Every time you see them, they're talking about Christian, 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 Christian. Because that's what they talked about. You see? Because they had Christ in them. When you've got Christ in you, you are a new creature. Okay? You have a new citizenship in the heavens. Which is a gift. You didn't earn it. Okay? You understand? Okay? How did I get out of So you receive these sonship rights. Justification. Righteousness. And you also have the ministry of reconciliation. Which is given to you. And the word of reconciliation committed to you. So that you can reach others. Talk to others also. And bring them into the household. I missed something. I missed it. But I don't remember what it was. Putting off. Putting on. 
like old garments, like working all day, take them off, take a shower, you're clean, you put your new clothes on. It's kind of the same principle, except it's in the mind. I already know I have eternal life, and you do too. Because it's that you may know, that you may know, that you know, that you know there's no more guests. He wants you to know it. And you have to boldly claim it. Because somebody will take it out of your heart. Oh, they're going to try. And God wants us to know it. He does not want us to be ignorant concerning the adversary because he will mess with your mind, but you don't let him. You stay put on God's word. Don't ever let him tell you that you are worthless, ever, because Jesus Christ gave his life for you. Now what we got to do is move toward the renewed mind and claim it. We claim that victory through Christ. No longer me, it's through Christ. I claim that victory. That's it. And that goes along with healing, Holy Spirit, and everything else. How did I get off on all of that? I have no idea. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have called us to be your sons and daughters. Lord God, that you have cemented in us the knowledge of your word, that we may apply it and learn. We are growing. Lord God, we are all at different levels, but because of your mercy and your grace, we are able to claim the rights that we have as sons and daughters. Lord, I thank you for blessing everyone here, and that everyone has a wonderful day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.